Hello, uh, welcome to uh, another virtual program from Maine Historical Society. I'm Kathleen Newman, Manager of Education and Public Programs at Maine Historical Society. Uh, and tonight's uh, program, today is January 7th, 2021. And uh, joining us this evening is Dr. Richard Kahn uh, to talk about medicine in early Maine um, and his new book about Jeremiah, Jeremiah Barker and diseases in the District of Maine. Dr. Richard Kahn is an internist and medical historian who grew up in New Jersey and graduated from Rutgers University and Tufts University School of Medicine, where his interest in medical history began. After an internship at Maine Medical Center in Portland, he spent two years in the US Public Health Service and then returned to MMC for a residency in internal medicine. Practicing in Rockport, Maine, he has had academic teaching appointments at Tufts, Dartmouth, and the University of Vermont Medical Schools, and has always tried to interest his students and residents in medical history. Assisted by his wife, Patricia, a medical librarian, uh, Dr. Khan began work on the Jeremiah Barker papers more than 30 years ago with the rediscovery of the Barker manuscript at the Maine Historical Society Library in Portland and has continued that work ever since, culminating uh, at last in the publication of Diseases in the District of Maine, 1772 to 1820, the unpublished work of Jeremiah Barker, a rural physician in New England, uh, which is available through our museum store here at Maine Historical Society. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khan, for joining us this evening. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And I, I hope some some old friends are listening and watching. Uh, I've had I've really enjoyed putting this together for you, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I have putting it together. Thank you. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. So I'm going to uh, turn the presentation over to you. Okay. Let's see if this works. <clears throat> so so 200, 200 years ago, twenty twenty uh, was a historic year. Uh, 400 years ago, the Pilgrims landed in Plymouth. Oops. Uh, 200 years ago, Maine became a state. 100 years ago, American women got the vote. And about a year ago, a year and two days, the World Health Organization issued its first COVID-19 outbreak. And of course, uh, yesterday, uh, the first time since 1814, the um, capital was broken into, but that's, we're not going there today. Uh, <clears throat> I, I just like to, um, uh, to point out that, uh, you know, women got the vote, but the first person to see a coronavirus, of which COVID-19 is one, it's also the cold virus, was June Almeida. She's from Glasgow, Scotland, a poor woman. She grew up in a flat couldn't afford to go on to school, but she made it to the Glasgow Infirmary, Ontario Cancer Institute, and she became a world-class micro um, electron microscopist, and taught many of the early electron microscopists. So I'd like to honor her. <clears throat> this whole thing began um, in 1990. I asked Glenn Skillings, the then curator of the Maine Historical Society, um, anything of medical interest I should know about. I was working on some other project. And he said, oh, see collection uh, 13, the Jeremiah Barker collection. And that's what started me off. This is uh, a picture of, uh, of uh, Glenn and me about two years ago, two, three years ago, uh, and his book, uh, a Bibliography of Maine Imprints. Well, I started with it. <laughs> so, 30 years ago, I had the idea for a book. I was very excited when I saw this manuscript. It's an unusual manuscript. And in the 30 years on and off, I haven't been working on it continuously for 30 years. I haven't found anybody that, that feels otherwise, that, that it isn't an unusual manuscript. Well, how do you write a book? I've never written a book. I transcribed the manuscript. Um, and so I, so I read about how to write a book. <laughs> had, you know, books on history, uh, you know, writing history. And I've been attending medical history meetings for 30, 40 years. But again, I, I've never written a book. So I wrote a 19 page uh, uh, proposal and expected nobody to accept it to my surprise. And I won't go into this any further unless somebody's interested. Oxford University Press, the editor, liked it. And uh, 
it went on from there. So the past two years, I've been working practically full time on this, and it was published in August. So um, this is the dust jacket um, of the book. It was designed by my, my by my wife, Patty Kahn. Uh, it's a, it's a um, page of the manuscript. Uh, the Oxford University Press, the art department, uh, uh, you know, fooled with a little bit, but basically it was her design. She's helped me throughout this, this project, with this project and everything else in my life. Couldn't do anything without her. Um, uh, a couple cartoons, uh, these two little kids, it's called a book. Uh, uh, where, do you, where do you put the batteries? Um, and this, uh, just to open it and read it, you don't need a password. Well, books have changed quite a bit in the past couple thousand years. Stephen Greenblatt wrote The Swerve, uh, and got the Pulitzer Prize uh, 10 years ago. And it's about a, a poem, 50 BC, uh, on the nature of things, about the, uh, the world is made up of atoms. It had to do, not everything is religion. And anyway, it, the, the church wasn't overly enthusiastic about it, understatement. I won't go into it, but it's a great book if you're, if you're interested. But in that book, uh, Greenblatt said, until the fourth or fifth century AD, we scrolled for information. Think of the Torah, uh, think of the uh, scrolls in, at the library in Alexandria. So we were scrolling for information. Then with the codex, C-O-D-E-X, the uh, books as we know it, uh, pages, um, for the next 1,500 years, we were turning pages. But at the end of the 20th century, we started scrolling again. And I would guess that many people that are watching, listening today are scrolling a lot for information. And in writing a book, from from uh, downtown Martinsville, Maine. I'm so happy that at least the past few years to be able to get so much of this by scrolling by uh, online and a big help. Well, <clears throat> Jeremiah, Mark, Jeremiah Barker was a friend of Dr. Elihu Barker, who's a physician in Gorham. <clears throat> You'll see her, uh, Barker practiced in Gorham. Anyway, um, uh, sometime before 1831, when, when Baxter moved, uh, uh, moved to Orono, um, uh, he had a fever. Barker bled him, you know, that was standard, gave him some uh, salts, and uh, he must have done okay. He, he, he died 30 years later. Now, he's the father, Elihu, Dr. Elihu Baxter is the father of James Finney Baxter, who was president of this organization for 30 years. And he was the grandfather of Percival Baxter of um, a Katahdin State Park, and he was, he was governor. So Barker, Barker helped Baxter way back then. And I want to thank the Maine Historical Society for the people that have helped me through the years. Certainly Nick Noyes, who recently retired, he's helped me for many years. Bill Barry in reference, uh, uh, Tiffany Link, I don't have her image, unfortunately. And Jamie Rice is, is, uh, is now head of the library and she's been a, a big help. And of course, Richard DeBatey was uh, executive director and now Steve Bromage. They've all been helpful with this project. I think 30 years ago, they didn't think it would take uh, 30 years to uh, get this done, but nobody pressured me. Um, <clears throat> why medical history? Who gives, who gives a crap about it? Well, medical history, it gives us a critical perspective on the contingency of knowledge production and circulation. It's changing. It's affected by all sorts of things. It helps clinicians, physicians, and, and the public. It gives them the ability to tolerate ambiguity. We, we make decisions. We don't have all the information we would like. We do the best we can. And I think that's one of the things medical history helps us with. My hero, Sir William Osler, um, uh, 120, he was at Hopkins at the time, professor of medicine. In 1902, he wrote, um, philosophies of one age have become the absurdities of the next and the foolishness of yesterday has become the wisdom of tomorrow. How true that is. Well, he wrote in 1896, humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine, and war. And by these, by far the greatest and most terrible is fever. Well, that was true. Uh, I'll show you in a second, a um, uh, hundred years ago. Uh, but with this COVID-19, it's a whole different story. We're going, we haven't had We've been spoiled. We haven't had anything like this since, 19, since the 1918 flu epidemic. But before that, these epidemics were common. Um, the 10 leading causes of death, 
um, in the United States in 1900, where pneumonia, tuberculosis, and diarrhea and enteritis, uh, all infectious diseases. Life expectancy was 47. But if you, had a, if you could make it through 15, 16, you had a fair chance of making it to 60. So, so many of the kids, children died. If you see, go to old cemeteries, you see uh, so many young children that each, dying at young ages. Um, but by the end of the century, 1997 this is, it's changed to chronic diseases, heart disease, cancer, and stroke. Life expectancy has continually increased. It's up to 77 years, although this year it will probably decrease for the first time with this COVID-19 decrease somewhat. <clears throat> but put it in perspective, the number of deaths, uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, 2,400 deaths, 9-11, uh, 29, 77, and this cartoon, whatever, you, uh, December 9th, any, just another Wednesday, 31,000 deaths. So this is a real epidemic, and we'll be talking about epidemics. My plan to, uh, for my talk today, I'm going to uh, talk, what's in Jeremiah Barker's uh, History and District of Maine? It's a primary source. It's uh, part of the book is what he wrote exactly as he wrote it, and I'll talk about that, um, <clears throat> 200 years ago epidemics, diseases, treatments, a bit of epistemology, that is the theory and the grounds of knowledge, its limits and, and validity, and a framework for thinking about disease over time. Some general con uh, comments on ge um, medical geography and epidemic disease, and something about knowledge and uncertainty in 1812 and 2020, 2020 um, 1820, excuse me, and 2020. Um, you might say com consumption to COVID-19. And now the book. This is the story of a lost manuscript, an unpublished book written 200 years ago by a rural physician in New England. Um, it was released by Oxford University Press in August of 2020, and I hope it will be an important new primary source for medical history, research, and teaching. The Jeremiah Barker papers consist of two manuscript boxes containing letters, case books, several texts with marginalia by Barker, plus his unpublished manuscript. Uh, it's a 50-year record of his reflections on diseases, diagnosis, treatments, and outcomes with an unusual effort to consult and cite the medical literature and other physicians in a changing medical landscape as the practice and authority shifted from historical to scientific methods. It wasn't all of a sudden, but it was gradually shifting in Barker's time. In short, it's a remarkable record of medicine as practiced in Northern New England 200 years ago. This is a subscription paper uh, for the book, um, meaning uh, a person promised in advance to, to uh, take a certain number of copies when it was published. It was, it was subscriptions were particularly in smaller towns. Uh, I mean, if you, in certain books, if you're, if you're printing the Bible, everybody's going to buy the Bible. But what about a book like this? So it was printed by subscription. And this subscription paper, um, uh, it tells us that the book was to include some biographical sketches, um, that it would inquire into the causes, nature, and prevalency of consumption. And consumption uh, was a term used for tuberculosis before the 1850s, mid-19th mid century. So that's what you're generally talking about when the word consumption comes up. Um, uh, Barker maintained that it was curable, and the, and the book was written so as to be, he wrote, he wrote, write this on the subscription paper, written so as to be intelligible to those who are destitute of medical science. So it was for other physicians, but it was also for uh, um, a general public that was interested in this. You go to a, lot, a bookstore uh, uh, nowadays, I mean, once we can go back in bookstores, there's big sections on medicine, different organs. Uh, uh, so people were interested in medicine then. It would be sold, so Barker's book would be sold for $2 in boards. By boards, that means uh, they, would, they would be bound, sewn, sewn together, the, the signatures of the book, and it would be cardboard, so you could bind it yourself, you know, leather, whatever you wanted to, to bind it. So, and it, it came to $2, it was being sold for $2 in boards. Uh, that's about, in purchasing power, that's about $43 today. And when I checked uh, bookstores in, Bos in Boston and New York, that's about what medical books cost at the time. Although the printed subscription paper says the cases were to begin in 1772, Barker actually recorded epidemics and diseases back to 1735 using the diary of Reverend Thomas Smith. He was the minister of the first parish church. I believe he started in 1727. But 
um, he started keeping his diary of diseases in 1735. So uh, Barker knew him, actually took care of him towards the end of his life. Um, and like many ministers, um, Smith tended to the medical as well as the spiritual needs of his parishioners. If anybody's interested in that, there's a wonderful book, The Angelical Conjunction by Patricia Watson, 1991, on minister physicians. <clears throat> The publication uh, of the uh, Barker's manuscript will be fully annotated and includes my five chapter introduction. Chapter one is describing Barker's background, education and writing. Chapter two, the difficulty at obtaining medical literature through books, journals, newspapers and the post. Chapter three about the changing medical climate and as science was supplanting the words of Hippocrates and Galen. And also why um, why did Barker write this book and why was it not published? That's, that's, I have to guess on that one. Chapter four examines Barker as a dangerous, uh, he was called a dangerous innovator. Being an innovator was a derogatory term. You know, you're supposed to follow the algorithm, do what everybody else was doing. This is true today. If somebody's going off, I don't know, deep end uh, in one way, but he was experimenting with the new chemistry of Lavoisier. He, uh, um, he read in 1795, he read uh, Lavoisier's chemistry and he published, this is 1798, this is his first major article in the first medical journal of the United States, uh, the second year of the first medical journal. And that's um, Marie Anne and um, Antoine Lavoisier. Uh, they were a team. Uh, she, uh, she translated Priestley um, from English to French. She w did the experiments with him. And I think most of the illustrations, if not all of them, um, of his chemical apparatus were done, by, were done by her. So they were a team. And finally, chapter five um, suggests ways uh, for a general reader to approach a 200 year old medical manuscript or any manuscript avoiding presentism, a post hoc fallacy and confirmation bias. <clears throat> I ask readers to evaluate Jeremiah Barker's medical knowledge, therapy, and reasoning, avoiding presentism. And that's, historians talk about this all the time. That is the tendency to use present day ideas and perspectives to judge a 200 year old medical document. Uh, somebody has a bad leg, oh, why don't we get an x-ray? Well, they didn't have x-rays, I'm just being silly. But um, uh, Jackie Duffin, a wonderful medical historian in Canada, at Queen's College, uh, Queen's University, um, uh, it's unfair and anachronistic to blame predecessors for not saying, seeing, and knowing what could not yet be said, seen, or known. I ask uh, the readers to consider the post hoc um, uh, fallacy, that is the assumption that one event uh, is thought to cause a later event simply because it occurred early. I'll tell you, that's an issue in medicine today. I stood near an open window and got a cold. They were causally related. They, they may or may not be causally, they're probably not causally related, but that was an issue. And within the numerical method was coming in actually towards the end of um, um, Barker's uh, practice, um, uh, but it was used for a few um, procedures like a smallpox inoculation, that's not vaccination, inoculation by Zabdiel Boylston in Boston, 1721, it was published in 1726. Uh, there were some population studies, some epidemiology using bills of mortality, but not much as far as numerical method in the um, evaluation of various medical treatments. And Finally, uh, confirmation bias. We remember things that conform to our previously held ideas. That's true today. And that was, you know, 400 years ago. Um, uh, uh, Francis Bacon wrote, the human understanding when it is once adopted, uh, draws all things else to support and agree with it. And though there may be greater number and weight on the other side, yet these it either neglects and despises or else by some distinction sets aside and rejects. So confirmation, so uh, confirmation bias is an issue today. Here you see a map of the Northern New England coastline with Cape Cod at the bottom and the curving coast of Maine at the top. As you all well know, until 1820, Maine was part of Massachusetts. Well, this map is 1755 and um, uh, it wasn't yet a district of Maine. It, this map says it's the eastern part of Massachusetts. Um, <clears throat> 
Parker was born in 1752 in Situate, Massachusetts, in his house. Um, he had a classical education under Reverend Mr. Cutter, a congregational minister. His medical training consisted of a preceptorship under Bella Lincoln um, in, of Hingham, Massachusetts. Um, preceptorship or apprenticeship uh, um, uh, was at the time the most common form of training for American physicians who had any training at all. There wasn't anything you could just put out a shingle and say, I'm a doctor. Um, but we have to bear in mind that there are only two medical schools in the colonies at that time, uh, Philadelphia, later uh, University of Pennsylvania, and New York, it was King's College. Uh, after the revolution, it was uh, Columbia. Harvard had no medical school until 1782. But fortunately for Barker, his, um, his preceptor was a 1754 graduate of Harvard College. And after preceptorship, his own preceptorship, he studied in London, received an MD, and then uh, um, uh, studied at King's College, Aberdeen, 1765. So here you see a map of the Massachusetts coastline from Boston to Cape Cod. Um, Barker would move to Maine after serving on the ill-fated uh, Bagaduce or a Penobscot expedition in uh, July and August 1779. Uh, uh, that's Castine. Uh, you, most of you probably know about this. The, the fort was being built. Uh, we sent something like 40 ships up there. Uh, the army said, we're not gonna go near them until the Navy got to get rid of the cannons. And the Navy said, we're not gonna go near them until, until the army gets rid of the cannons. Uh, and finally, the uh, uh, British men of war came up the river, drove them up the river, and either we or they burned our ships. And Barker was on one of those ships. And he said, it's, he, he wrote that um, he saved some medicines um, uh, from, from his ship, and it helped him get started as medicines were difficult to obtain at the time. In 1780, um, Barker moved to Maine writing. This is, he's, I tried to as much as possible use his words, finding the air in Cape Cod injurious to my constitution and physicians being numerous, I removed to Gorham. Uh, he didn't say anything about the traffic. Um, <laughs> Barker married into the prominent Gorham family, which had originally settled that town. In 1789, he moved to Stroudwater, uh, now part of Portland, um, and in 1799, he built this house, um, which is extant. It's down Westbrook Street from the Tate, on the same side of the street as the Tate, uh, Tate House. Uh, so if anybody's interested in seeing it. Um, uh, he retired from practice in 1818, and he died in 1835 at age uh, 83. This is his gravestone in, in the Strawwater um, uh, Cemetery. This map shows, um, uh, location of Barker's new home in the district of Maine, uh, both, in Bor uh, both in Gorham and uh, Thomas Stroudwater. His practice covered everything on this map, um, uh, as well as towns northeast along the coast beyond what you see here. One of the ways uh, Barker kept up with current medicines was correspondence with other physicians, including some elites of his age. Uh, this is an excerpt from a, a letter from uh, Barker to Benjamin Rush in Philadelphia. <clears throat> uh, he went to uh, the College of New Jersey, later it was called Princeton. He trained in Edinburgh, was professor of medicine, wrote several texts, and was a signer, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So Barker says, thus, says Barker to Rush, I had the opportunity of observing the habits, customs, and manners of living among the first settlers. Um, in many towns, I noted these things, always carrying a pen, ink, and paper. The first white inhabitants in Maine lived for a time in a very <clears throat> similar manner as the Indians did. Their exercise was great, their food simple and wholesome, consisting chiefly of Indian corn and salted pork, sometimes bear. Rum could be procured in small, uh, in <clears throat> rum could be procured in small quantities and happy it would have been for them and their posterity had this continued to be the case. Rum today, and today was 1806 when he wrote this letter, Rum today is conveyed to the country towns as it were through aqueducts, but none is lost for want of throats. People don't write that way anymore. So this is Barker's manuscript, volume one and volume two. Volume one um, includes mental illness, the dangers of spirits, as liquors, various epidemics and diseases, pneumonia, childhood fever, apoplexy, strokes, um, and anasarca, you know, the body filling up with fluid. <clears throat> Chapter two is about consumption. 
its history, prevention, uh, diagnosis, and treatment. Uh, here are a couple examples of the pages we work with. On the right is one of the manuscript pages, which have been faithfully transcribed exactly as written, including crossed, including crossed out words with original punctuation, grammar, and spelling. Uh, Barker's, and he was a good speller, uh, Barker's many references have been located and cited. I think I found all of them. Uh, <clears throat> and people identified whenever possible. I've written a glossary of something like 300 words to make it accessible to 21st century readers. On the left is a page from his, um, uh, from one of his case books. And I went through the case books when he had a case, a patient's history in a case book that he did at the bedside. It was, he, he kept to the script. In his manuscript, it was just the same. It wasn't, uh, he wasn't glossing over or making things sound better than they were. <clears throat> Barker was determined to add to the medical literature as well as keeping up with it. The first US medical journal, the Medical Repository, was launched July 1797. And in it, Barker announced his intention to publish his book. That's what this announcement is. In the course of practice, uh, he published at least 12 articles in the medical repository, uh, generally re um, uh, unusual events, epidemics, and his use of alkaline therapy. This is how it was a quarterly journal, and this is how it went out to the public. Whenever you see it in a medical history repository, it's always bound. I've never seen it like this. Um, uh, in the course of uh, uh, a practice. Uh, um, here's a, a list of the articles that he published in the medical repository. I don't expect you to read these, but um, uh, uh, febrile diseases in Cumberland County, measles, various things. Here are some more of his articles and one article that was in the Philadelphia Medical J Museum, which was the second medical journal in the United States. So from uh, Portland and Gorham, he's publishing in the first medical journals in the United States. <clears throat> One unusual outbreak facing Barker and his community was an epidemic of severe infections in 1784. He wrote of Captain Grapham um, <clears throat> of Wyndham, age 60, of good habit, who broke the skin of, uh, of his leg over his tibia. The, the wound readily um, inflamed, put on a gangrenous hue, turned black, red streaks up to the body, and he died in 14 days. So a number of people were having at this time, we're having these infections with trivial wounds. At the same time, um, at the same time, um, uh, there was a terrible epidemic of childbed fever. They had never seen an epidemic of childbed fever. Um, uh, Barker appeared to see the connection between these two unusually virulent outbreaks. From the 21st century, we'd probably say that there was a, a virulent group, uh, group A beta hemolytic strep floating around the community probably spread by doctors and nurses, but um, that was around. Uh, so he wrote, uh, that same spring, uh, several women were attacked with uh, fever in the purple state around their delivery. Um, and in most all, the disease proves fatal. It has a very high mortality. It always has had a high mortality, um, at least in my own practice, but also the practice of others. Barker wrote many pages on the uh, on the, uh, childbed fever in Portland and Gorham, what he did, what he read, who he wrote to. Um, but again, this was the first, no main physicians had witnessed this. Um, and we're talking about this is a good uh, uh, 40 years before Ignaz Semmelweis and uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes were writing about this. Um, <clears throat> He also had a lengthy public discussion uh, with Nathaniel uh, Coffin, who was a physician in Portland, uh, and it was published in the Falmouth Gazette of 1785. Um, the epidemic stopped of its own accord uh, after one year. It's interesting in uh, Aberdeen, Scotland, about the same time uh, Alexander Gordon was writing in his practice, uh, there was an epi not just his practice, there, were, there was uh, a an epidemic of childbed fever in Aberdeen. It lasted about three or four years. Um, <clears throat> a couple of case studies uh, will illustrate how Barker used the literature for guidance. His patient narratives include uh, this case of consumption. Uh, April 1790, a lady in Portland, age 40, had been troubled for some years with a slight catarrhal cough, you know, just raising a little bit of mucus. Um, she walked to church with kid shoes, in a thin dress 
and the ground was wet. I hope none of you women do this. Um, the next morning, her cough was worse as she expectorated bloody mucus, which recurred three mornings in succession, discharging two ounces each time. A moderate hectic, that is a fever, uh, with its uh, usual train ensued, and she died in July uh, following a three-month course. Soon after, a lady in the bloom of life rode 10 miles in a chaise, covered, she was wearing a, a muslin gown, and it was, it was, the evening was damp. The next morning, she awoke with hoarseness, pulmonary consumption ensued, and <clears throat> terminated life, her life in a few months. A physician ironically called this muslin consumption, muslin being a light cotton material that was in vogue in the early um, 19th century. Um, uh, and it gets its name from Mosul Iraq, Mosul, Mosul, Iraq, but actually I think it came from Bangladesh. But anyway, uh, so it was very light cotton. Uh, there was another risk of wearing uh, the fashionable muslin. Uh, it's very flammable. This is an 1802 uh, Gilray caricature titled The Advantage of Wearing Muslin, where this, uh, this woman is uh, in a room, and remember candles, lanterns, uh, fire in the fireplace, and this very flammable material. Well, as, as some of you may know, on July 11th, 1861, Fanny Longfellow's, uh, Henry Wentworth Longfellow's second wife, um, her dress caught fire, uh, causing her death. So that was July 11th, 1861. And one of uh, Longfellow's friends, uh, Charles Dickens, uh, was finishing up the last installment of Great Expectations, uh, was published the following month, August 1861, Miss Havisham's address burns and causes her death. It's probably, it was written earlier, it's probably just coincidental, but this makes me wonder. Suggestions um, for the diagnosis of consumption come from a number of sources, but this is uh, from Reed's uh, uh, um, book, in 1806. So there's wasting, destruction, loss of flesh, the body is being consumed. That's where the word consumption comes from. It usually has an insidious approach, gradually comes on, uh, um, and people are coughing up various material. Um, uh, hectic fever, fever in the morning and the evening. Now, how was fever diagnosed then? Um, thermometers had been invented. Um, actually several centuries earlier, Galileo, there was a Fahrenheit uh, thermometer, I think it was 1702, but they weren't being used clinically. So, so they weren't using thermometers to, when you say fever, what was your temperature? They weren't doing that. Um, it would be a, a feeling lousy, weak, sweaty, having chills, um, uh, loss of energy, and an increased pulse. That was part of the diagnosis, an increased pulse can see people who have rhythm problems may be called fever a lot. Homoptysis, that is coughing up blood, may or may not be present. I'm just gonna focus here on predisposing factors. Family history, that was important. That, that increased the likelihood that you were going to have it. And gender, it seemed to be more prevalent um, in women who, according to Barker and others, uh, compounded the problem by wearing those foolish light dresses and inadequate shoes, especially in the evening. Um, and here Barker cites uh, Joseph Young's uh, observation on thesis, it's pronounced several ways, but it's another name for consumption, written in 1809. The neck and breasts are bare, covered with a very thin gauze. If the breast is left open to facilitate the entrance of Cupid's dart, it affords a more certain mark for the envenom shaft of the grisly king of terrors. So Barker was concerned about women's clothing in the weather northeast of, in the Northeast, uh, cold, wet, snow. Uh, the French were also concerned about clothing and consumption, but they also seemed to be very interested in fashionable clothing, the stays that were compressing women's uh, uh, chest walls. So consumption tuberculosis is still a problem, not as much in this country, but it's the leading cause of infectious disease killer worldwide. 1.5 million people die each year um, uh, of consumption. In this case from volume uh, one, chapter one, a case of insanity, January 1809, Miss L.H. of Scarborough, age 20, brought up in a farmer's house and she complained of universal heat. 
she was hot all the time in a room that everybody was comfortable with. She was taking off her blouse or whatever. She was, in July, she became insane and friends confined her, tied her with cords. Barker was consulted in August and bled her five times in four weeks from the arm, taking a pint each time, twice from her feet in like quantity. Before bleeding, she would rave and laugh alternately, um, and she made attempts to hurt her attendants with a pair of scissors. Again, these are his words, um, which she had concealed. Uh, she recovered for a time, but insanity returned. So the following February, about a year later, she had tea with a neighbor, and she complained of heat and pain in the head, and on return, she, uh, she leaped into a well of water, which extinguished heat and life. Now you say, drawing all that blood, there wasn't any other good treatment. You, know, you could hit somebody on the head if they were uh, delirious, uh, psychotic, um, but that was one of the standard, uh, standard treatments. Um, Barker cited Pinnell, who was um, uh, in France, and he was one of the authority, the leaders of the uh, moral treatment of mentally ill. Um, moral treatment, they meant treat people humanely. Don't tie them, don't uh, chain them to a wall and throw stones at them. Treat them um, the, hum humanely as much as possible. And um, he said bloodletting uh, is sometimes useful, but it's, it can be useful, but sometimes it's spilled so lavishly as to render doubtful whether the patient or the physician has the best claim to the appellation of madman. Barker tried to steer a course between Pinnell and Benjamin Rush, who favored more vigorous bloodletting. Certainly relieving a violent man of a significant amount of blood would work to calm him down. In Boston, George, Dr. George Parkman, uh, his father's very wealthy, Parkman, Maine, that he owned that, he used to come up here every so often. Um, uh, he writes the standard treatment laxative purges and mercurials using mercury that caused salivation, increased saliva. In Barker's day, salivation uh, produced by uh, mercury was considered beneficial for a wide variety of illnesses. Parkman, uh, in fact, Parkman read Barker's chapter on mental illness and sent it back to him. He wanted to see it. He asked him for it, and he sent it back with some off prints of, of uh, articles on mental illness. Parkman, uh, some of you may know, uh, was murdered in 1849 by John Webster, who was pre professor of chemistry at the medical school and uh, across, um, across the Charles uh, at Harvard College. And as a matter of fact, John Webster was a neighbor of the um, Longfellows who were living at the Craigie House. Um, interesting, I found John Sibley, he wrote in his diary, because I, I knew he kept a diary, and he wrote, um, uh, the people in Boston thought him guilty and in Cambridge innocent. The people around Harvard said he could, is one of us. He can't, he can't have done Boston. They said he did it. And it was like an OJ Simpson trial and he was, he was hanged. Um, this is from a Rush's book on mental on diseases of the mind. It's the first book published in this country on diseases of the mind, uh, 1812. And it, it, explaining the usefulness of mercury, mercury salivation in abstracting the excitement from the brain to the mouth. This is humoral, uh, uh, um, you know, too much of this or too little of this, trying to get an imbalance um, by removing visceral obstructions, uh, by changing uh, the patient's complaints by fixing them wholly on the sore mouth. With the mercury, you get a sore mouth. It just reminds you, you have a bad headache, smash your thumb with a hammer, takes your mind off your headache. And then by all means, make the patient angry at the physicians um, and friends so they forget about being insane. This is about, this is the last case that I'm going to present. It is a cluster of uh, diseases, 1795, August, 1795. Noah Webster, and by the way, this is Dictionary Webster. He didn't start working on his dictionaries until about 1800, uh, but he was a counter. He was, if we're going to have a successful country, we can't have the major, uh, major port cities, which were the major cities closing down every summer with this yellow fever that was occurring. So he wrote, I've never experienced a state of air so debilitating and unfriendly to animal spirits as the month of August, 1795 in Philadelphia. Remember W.C. Fields, first prize is one week in Philadelphia, second prize is two weeks in Philadelphia. Anyway, the bills of mortality showed double the usual number of deaths 
a bilious fever or yellow fever was present in 1795. What, Bar what Webster did was send a broadside up and down the coast, tell me what's going on. There's no medical journal, this is 1795. There's no medical journal in the United States. Uh, there's no place that this information is put together. He said, send me what's going on in your communities and I'll publish it. And he did, he published this book in 1796, a collection of papers. And he said he wasn't going to continue work on this. This led directly to the medical repository. I, I, that's another story and I can't get into it right now. Uh, but this is the book he published in 1799 um, on uh, uh, epidemic and pestilential disease, uh, two volume and the principal phenomena of physical world that precede or accompany them. Uh, they thought epidemic diseases, why, do, why is this year a bad year? It may have to do with a volcano that occurred in Iceland or may have to do with a, an earthquake or, or something with the stars. Um, now back to the case. Um, William Knight, uh, was a, a, a seaman, was attacked with fever in Philadelphia. He took passage for Falmouth, Maine, his native place, where he arrived on the 23rd day this is August 23rd. He lodged in a, and lodged in a decayed house containing nine in the family. I'm not sure where it was, whether it was in town or a little bit more rural. Uh, he died uh, 11th of September, attended with black stools and yellow skin. So he came from Philadelphia had, uh, where there was an epidemic of yellow fever. He had fever and uh, became jaundiced and black stool. That is, sounds like, uh, certainly sounds like yellow fever. Two weeks after his death, a sister, age 13, was seized with vomiting, pain in the head. She was ill for about 30 days, but eventually she recovered. But during her sickness, a brother, age seven, was attacked with fever. He hemorrhaged from the nose. Um, it took place in the second week. He had black stools, and he died on the 14th day. A sister, age 18, was seized with fever, died on the eighth day after profuse hemorrhage from her bowels took place. Mother, age 49, was seized and died on the ninth day, attended with black stools. So they were all having intestinal bleeding. They were um, attended by a French physician, have to watch out for those French physicians, um, who gave them gentle evacuants, laxatives, and prescribed wine with elixir vitriol to stop, stop the putrefaction, as he said. So this is Barker's words, as he said. Basically, Barker saying, I'm not buying into this at this point. He was into alkaline therapy. He'd read Lavoisier, and this is what, well, what is elixir vitriol? And it was a standard of care through the, uh, through the 18th century. Um, elixir vitriol is dilute sulfuric acid, alcohol, and an aromatic such as cinnamon. Um, so three days before the death um, of the mother, a uh, daughter, age 25, was seized with fever. And I, Barker, was called on the sixth day. Her eyes, uh, um, she was jaundiced, her eyes were red. Uh, she, uh, uh, she couldn't sit up. He treated her, said, uh, I made liberal use of aquacalcis, that's alkaline, basically Tums, liquefied Tums, that sort of thing, uh, and plenty of fluids. She soon recovered, as did a young man who had similar uh, symptoms. And I just want to point out here, <clears throat> so they recovered. In, in that period, you know, 200 years ago, uh, they talk about the, the doctor exhibited medicines. If you were ill and I treated you, and over the next week you got better, we would both assume you got better, but the medicine didn't work. If I gave you something and within uh, several hours you had 10 bowel movements or vomited 17 times and or over the next several days started salivating and you got better, we would assume the medicine worked. There had to be a physiologic response and that's the way they thought about it. It's more complicated than that. The sick room was washed with soap suds and whitewashed um, and of the family, um, the people that were attacked um, four of the six died, 67% mortality. And that's the sort of thing you, get, you can get with yellow fever. Um, he also had put this comment in, uh, when a seaman arrives in the West Indies, changes his diet for fresh meat, and happens to be thus invaded, um, it's called yellow fever. But might it be, you know, the meat, the food, it's, might it not be yellow fever? Well, practicing in Maine, that was probably more right than, than, than wrong. Yellow fever, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so as I said, Barker read Lavoisier's chemistry, um, uh, 
acid alkali fermentation in 1795. And he said, not being authorized to bleed or use mercury in certain situations uh, because of its putrid ten supposed putrid tendency. And I, he never found any good effects. Uh, my views were directed to the use of alkalins and their known tendency to check and even remove apparent putre putrescency, putrid, foul odor in inanimate subjects, as well as he's found it was effective in various fevers. So just think about an outhouse. The, and they were into stench. You know, if stench, there's probably disease around. And so think of an outhouse that with a terrible stench, what do people do? You, you, you put lye, strong alkaline in there. I just want to raise the, you know, this was this yellow fever, raises the issue of retrospective diagnosis. And historians, medical historians are very leery of this. Um, uh, we're on sh shaky grounds, uh, trying to think the way they thought uh, 200 years ago and their descriptions of disease. Well, I sent this case to Randall Packard at Johns Hopkins, historian and uh, a physician, and, and uh, Scott Halstead who's one of the world authorities on yellow fever and dengue. And was this yellow fever? Well, they both said, I've never, I wasn't aware of yellow fever in Maine, uh, but uh, uh, Scott Halstead said they sound, most of those cases in that, in that sound like yellow fever. And as a matter of fact, there's a book in 1909, August by Augustine, 1200 pages on yellow fever. And there are several entries for, for Maine. And one of them uh, is a case study that um, of Barker's from the medical repository. Um, uh, as far as I can see, there were several deaths, like one of the cases, um, the case that uh, Barker described, but it never got out. So there was never the community epidemic of, of yellow fever, but the people that came on the ship and several people on the ship died jaundice and bleeding. I should mention, a bit of medical nationalism found its way into uh, Barker's manuscript, probably due to the War of 1812. Um, and this is from, he cited the New England Journal of Medicine, 1813. This is the second year of the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, America, said the learned editors of the London Medical Review, seems to be a country of epidemics as much as swamps, woods, and savannas. England, we might say in return, seems to be a country of scrofula, that's tuberculosis of lymph nodes, and consumption as much as it is fogs and vapors. Such observations are at least injudicious, not to say incorrect. And finally, um, uh, I'm enormously grateful to a number of historians, but particularly John Harley Warner, who not only did a uh, markup of, the, of my manuscript, but wrote a, a lovely forward. And he, uh, I'll, I'll close this section of my talk with his words. Uh, he said, the Jeremiah Barker manuscript offers an extraordinary window into a, a medical world of one non-elite, non-urban physician in the early Republic, and gives us an accessible, engaging, and important source for exploring and reimagining that world. It's also of interest that 60 miles away from Jeremiah Barker, um, uh, Martha Ballard is practicing uh, midwifery in Hallowell, um, so well written about um, uh, using her diary by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Um, she got a Nobel Prize, I think, in, 18, in 1991. Uh, so she was practicing midwifery, a social um, and folk medicine, and Barker was trying to be a scientific physician. Um, uh, Laurel uh, 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 Ulrich said, um, uh, Martha Ballard never read a book. She didn't, so she, it was all hand me, you know, information, word of mouth. So now I'd like to get into something a little bit different to finish up. Uh, the Royal Society um, uh, started in 1660 in London, and their motto was uh, nullius in verba, is taken to mean, uh, no, take nobody's word for it. Um, if we disagreed about something, if you found something in Galen 140 AD, uh, the discussion would end, thus saith Galen, and the, arp, the discussion is over. Well, that was changing. Uh, maybe got a little bit carried away, take nobody's word for it. We can't be absolutely certain until we run some tests, but your initial blood work indicates that you may have a large spear through your right shoulder. 
Then there's some paraprosdokians about knowledge and history. That's paraprosdokians are really fun. It's a figure of speech where the later part of the century of the sentence or phrase surprises you and it makes you rethink the first part. Light travels faster than sound. This is why some people appear bright until you hear them speak. That may be appropriate for your speaker this evening. Um, to steal ideas from one person is plagiarism. To steal from many is research. And change, and certainly change in medicine, change is inevitable except from a vending machine. But certainty is not attainable in medicine. That's not a paraprosdokian. That's the way it is. So if we look at uh, how different groups looked at uh, disease, the Puritans, disease indicated um, individual or community, uh, or community spiritual status. Um, uh, you weren't going to church enough. You didn't read the Bible properly. You were having sex with your, your neighbor, whatever. Um, David Jones wrote a wonderful book about this, rationalizing. And one of the things that they would, the early settlers said, hey, the 90, 95% of the uh, Native Americans died with these various epidemics. And they would say, well, this is God saying that we belong here. They're getting rid, God is getting rid of these people. Um, not so funny. Um, uh, the 17th century environmental astro uh, and astrological um, influenza influence. Um, there were, you know, was the influence of the stars. Why was it a bad year? The 18th century um, enlightenment rejection of uh, traditional social, religious, and political ideas. Age of reason. Some separation of church and state. And it wasn't just the will of God science, medicine can do something about it. 19th century industrial revolution, steamships, travel, increased travel uh, injuries, travel diseases, travel related diseases, uh, 20th century, all these things, x-rays, uh, antibiotics, genetics. Um, and we, in 21st century, we're resolving some old diseases, but we're probably gonna have new ones like this one. We're not very good at predicting history. Uh, they're trying to use a, um, artificial intelligence to do a better job. Uh, but this was written uh, um, in 1820, the year of uh, Maine got statehood. Uh, George Hegel, a German philosopher, wrote the owl of Minerva, owl the symbol of Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, spreads its wings only with the falling of the dusk. When you're in the middle of things, it's hard to make sense out of it. A little bit down the road, and we'll be able to know better about COVID-19 uh, a little bit down the road. So we're going this way and that. Some non-medical technology has changed medical practice, and this is later, but there's the phone. Doctor can call patient, patient can call doctor, and this is something else. Uh, um, the first uh, main medical journal, 1910, the doctor, automobile for the doctor, Buick, 1800, 18 horsepower for only $800. Well, that's about 20, 2000 in uh, 2020. When I, I took care of Fred Campbell for many years, he began practice in Warren. And uh, I, I really enjoyed talking about the, the 1918 flu epidemic, but he rented his horse and buggy and sleigh for the first couple of years, and then he got his car. Medical therapy was changing. Here's a succinct history. Doctor, I have an earache. 2000 BC, or here, eat this root. 1000 AD, that root is heathen. Here, say this prayer. Um, 1850, that prayer is superstition. Here, drink this potion. 1940, that potion is snake oil. Here, swallow this pill. 1985, that pill is ineffective. Here, take this antibiotic. 2020, that antibiotic is unhealthy. Here, eat this root. And there's something to that. We're going, many things that antibiotics were used for, we're, we're finding we can do as well without an antibiotic. The common diseases in the 19th century, as I mentioned, GI diseases, leading killer of children, but consumption. Uh, the, eight, the 1850 census was the first census, US census that uh, had the causes of death. So in Maine, consumption was the leading cause in various fevers. Vaccination, big change, 1798. Uh, talk about that in a minute. But most of the um, immunizations were in the 20th century. I mean, if you look at these, um, uh, for example, uh, take measles, uh, half a million uh, in, in 1900, uh, 89 cases total in 1998. Uh, 48,000 smallpox in 1900, zero uh, in 1998. Mumps, uh, all these diseases. Um, big different, and, and the smallpox was eradicated uh, from the world uh, in 1980. 
the deaths from uh, infectious disease, deaths per 100,000 in the United States, um, markedly decreased, and it, but it was the public health things. It had to do with good um, uh, clean water, uh, clean food, that the government helps the state health departments. Um, you see, there's where sulfur came in, penicillin, streptomycin, so, but they were coming down. And see that big blip, that was the influenza epidemic. Um, so those were deaths of infectious disease, but the whole thing has been coming down. Now in 2020, you'd see a big blip going way up. Um, this is a, just a touch of medical geography. Hippocrates ta uh, talked air, places, and water. He knew certain places were more dangerous, but so does James Sullivan, who wrote the first history of the District of Maine um, in 1795. He was born in uh, Berwick, by the way. Um, the people in the District of Maine, uh, May, in a tedious winter, long for the soft breezes of Virginia and the Carolinas, but they may be very unwilling to take the um, a fever and ague um, uh, and other disorders incident to those states with the gentle weather in exchange for our northern snowbanks. So remember that in February and March in the snowbanks, you wouldn't want to get malaria and all those diseases down south. Um, the Puritans were, were heading south when they went to New England. Uh, they were a little bit surprised, I think. Uh, it was much colder and a number of illnesses uh, relative to that. <clears throat> um, epidemic means epi, uh, on, demos, people. The point that I want to make here, it's unpredictable. You can predict that there's going to be epidemic, but like uh, weather predictions, um, uh, we're not very good at it. We're better than we used to be, <clears throat> but epidemics interfere with normal function of society. So, um, I mean, for example, in diphtheria in the 1730s, some towns nearly half the children died. Um, but like uh, consumption and dysentery might kill more people in a year, but life went on. They, uh, nobody liked it, but uh, it didn't interfere with society as much as these epidemics. Uh, <clears throat> so some of the epidemics, smallpox, dysentery, fevers, um, uh, smallpox and diphtheria, uh, a yellow fever, as I mentioned in the early 18, uh, in the uh, late 1790s, early 1800s, and Asiatic cholera in this country after 1832. Um, polio, influenza in the 20th century. But again, the absolute number of deaths each year versus the impact on society. This is a 1793 engraving, you know, uh, people with yellow fever dying, they're, you know, bring out your dead. Well, this is from May 13th, 2020, uh, body storage trucks in Brooklyn. Um, this, is a real, this is the real thing. Uh, 1780 to 1820, how were these diseases thought to spread? Smallpox, venereal disease, they knew uh, person to person. But yellow fever and cholera, and that, well, they weren't so sure. Was it just ships and trade? Was it the filth and garbage piling up in the docks? Um, the cholera, the John Snow and the Broad Street Pump, uh, cholera, and what they, the epidemiologists, what John Snow and Reverend Henry Whitehead, uh, great book, uh, The Ghost Map, if you're interested in this, um, uh, they found that it was a pump that, that was infected, that, that had the, they didn't know that it was bacteria, but they knew that was what, when they, bought, they locked the, that particular well, uh, the disease stopped. It's more complicated than that, but it's interesting. Where are we now? Here's a couple of main metaphors. This is from our terrace looking out to sea. There's a, an island of knowledge, and we have islands of knowledge in a great sea of unknown. And as the island grows, so does the shores of our ignorance. It seems everything gets more complicated. Uh, Thomas Wakeley, founder of the British journal Lancet, wrote in 1854, before they knew it was uh, caused by a bacteria, we know nothing. We're at sea in a whirlpool of conjecture. I'm going to try to, as a non-epidemiologist, non-statistician, bring this, oh my God, how did this get in here? Uh, it's also, it has to do with the sea, but somebody must have hacked my slides. Um, when and how will COVID-19 end? There, there, there's a medical ending, and you're hearing from Fauci and Dr. Shaw, um, but there's a social political fear ending, a, a xenophobia. There's all sorts of other things, and a lot of people have written it. Politics has, oh, geez, another one. Um, politics have always been an issue. Uh, if you were the physician and you saw people, I think they have yellow fever, and you know if this got out, that you said it, and it ended up not being an epidemic, Meanwhile, everybody left town. Anybody with money or could possibly leave town, stores closed up. 
you win, win friends and influence people. There are three things necessary to stop an epidemic. You have to have an evidence base. You have to have information. Remember Webster, 1796, started trying to put all this together and make sense of it. And then the following year, the first medical journal. Uh, a method of implementation and a political will. So if we compare 1820 to 2020, um, uh, uncertainty was always an issue. Medical information, then they complained there was too little. And then we are inundated with information. And we have to be able to trust the sources. And that if politics enters into it too much or people are selling something, you've got to watch out for that. Uh, you lose trust in the, whole, in the whole thing. And that's really important. The noxious air. For Barker, uh, malaria, bad air, the stench I, I mentioned, miasms. Well, what are we talking about today? Aerosols and droplets. Um, sounds like bad air to me. Um, mask, that was the, that's a plague mask on your left. And that's 19 at uh, Peter Ben Brigham uh, uh, um, wearing masks for the uh, flu epidemic. Um, the evalu a difficulty evaluating the efficacy of therapy, whether it's bloodletting and alkali in Barker's time, or treatment, various treatments for COVID-19. We're still not sure many of the many of the treatments. Basically, there's not too much treatment except support. There's some. But if trying to make sense of, of all the stuff that we're getting, uh, there's a book that just came out, Calling Bullshit, uh, The Art of Skepticism in a Data-Driven World. It's a wonderful book. They teach, their two professors at the University of Washington, they teach a course on this. I mean, how to, how to evaluate data, uh, how to make sense of it, and be able to see, be skeptical of what you see. There's some things that are, they're try somebody's trying to put something over on you. In that, they say, science is a systematic work of observation data collection, and theorizing about natural causes or experimental production of knowledge. But if they say every fact or model can be overturned in the face of new evidence. And when I hear people say, oh, well, they said this, and it changes. As we get more information, it's, it, it, the, uh, we can change it. Self-correcting, and it's a cumulative process. It's not just there's the truth. And we're just about finished. Two mavens of this uh, um, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, Anthony Fauci, who you all know, he was asked, what's different about this COVID-19 business? He said, I've never seen a virus with a spectrum so, um, so extreme from nothing to death. The other COVID uh, um, people generally had symptoms and you can say, oh, this person's having symptoms. So many of the people don't have any symptoms, but they're spreading it to other people, to their grandparents, to people who work in stores, and that's a problem. Dr. Shaw, um, um, who at Maine CDC, who I think has been doing a wonderful job, he said, sadly, there's no vaccine to temper fear and xenophobia, fear of strangers during these outbreaks. And finally, the last slide, second slide. I mentioned cowpox vaccination in 1798. That made a big difference. That saved that you saw the deforming the women's face, anybody's face that get the uh, that get smallpox, high mortality, big. But these are anti-vaxxers um, in 17. This is 1802 uh, Gilray, um, and what they're uh, uh, they've had vaccination and cows and udders are coming out of their bodies in various places. I know it's utterly ridiculous, but anyway. Well, I read this about six months ago. Novavax is working on a vaccine that turns moth cells into tiny factories that pump out protein. And it looks, you know, I think it's, it's a good way, it may be a good way to do it, but as soon as I saw it, oh, there's gotta be a caricature there. And I asked a, a friend of mine that does caricatures if he could make one with people who got the, this moth pox vaccine. And this is what he did. The people who have had this vaccine have a constant urge to be about, uh, to be around candles and lampposts. And some of them have been seen munching on wool sweaters. Thank you for your attention. I'd be glad to answer questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Khan. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions from the audience. I'm going to share some of them with you now um, so that we can try and get to the, uh, as many of them as we can. Can I stop the screen share? Um, yes, you can, you can stop the screen share now. Thank you. Okay. So um, one question from Julie. Um, did all families, so we're thinking back to, to say, um, uh, Jeremiah's time, did all families have access to physicians no matter their place in society? I, I think that that's a very difficult question. Um, 
uh, there weren't any insurances. Uh, people who lived in small communities, the doctor was a neighbor, went to church with him. And I think a lot of people got taken care of. They, they wouldn't say, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have the cash, you don't have insurance, that wasn't an issue. Um, they would take care of them. So I think they, but all, I, I can't say all, some people uh, were skeptical of doctors, not so inappropriately, but, uh, uh, but I, that's, it's a good question. Um, no insurance, no, uh, mm. but and the, the poor were taken care of, there were physicians, the, the town would pay something. Um, patients would frequently, there was a whole uh, barter system. So somebody might be ill, they lived on a farm in Jefferson, Maine or wherever, and uh, uh, they might give the doctor a couple of chickens or some eggs, or I've, I've been given lobsters and stuff like that through the years. But it was, pro it was probably more of a, uh, an exchange in rural areas. And I, there's an article uh, from Massachusetts about talking about that, the barter exchange in rural um, uh, you know, farmers, et cetera. Uh Meg asks, um, was Dr. Barker a well-educated physician for his time? That's a very good question. I'd say uh, as far as physicians, um, he, I think he was pretty well educated. He, he apparently read French. I'm not absolutely sure about that. His Latin seems to be good. Um, he writes beautifully. Uh, his exp uh, so I, I think he, he had a good background training and he was a it sounds like a voracious reader he could whatever he could get his hands on he was trying to keep up he's a you might say a lifelong learner um, i just <laughs> i just joined, joined an organization uh, actually book people and uh, and they said uh, um, you know for whatever my age certain amount to join and student and so I said I should pay the extra ten dollars for students. So I <laughs> added them together because I'm a lifelong student. So I thought I should pay for that. Sure. Anyway, uh, Nan Nancy yes. asks, why was Dr. Barker's book not published after he saw oh. the subscriptions? Did, was he not able to raise the money? Was it something else? Do we know? Say that again. The end of that question. Why was um, Barker's book not? published did he was okay. able to raise the money in, or what in, was it in one of the chapters i discussed that and it's this is surmising you know there's i couldn't find any place i didn't publish this because mm -hmm. um uh one of the reasons maybe medicine was changing a great deal during barker's life it went from humors uh you know galen and uh <laughs> galen Galen and Hippocrates to the, this new science. And so things that he wrote starting in, he was, by 1797, he was already working on this. But I think it changed so much in those 20, 25 years that it may, again, I don't know this, uh, he may have felt, wait a minute, there's, uh, um, there's so much, this is not correct, you know, by 1820. Um, it may also be that um, um, there was something else that, uh, I, I discussed several reasons why um, why he may not have published it. Um, the finance, you know, he didn't want to publish it himself, and maybe there were, oh, there were a number of other books that were starting to come out, and some of them by people he knew uh, he knew well. Uh, the textbook of medicine, and um, uh, several of them in New in New England, and I've wrote I've written. In the, uh, in the book about some of those books that were coming out. Maybe he just felt the, um, um, the number of medical books from New England, uh, there were too many of them, whatever, that it wouldn't have sold. But I, I honestly don't know. And somebody asked me earlier today, if you had one question to ask uh, Barker, what would it be? And I think it would be that question, why didn't you publish it? What, what yeah. kept it? It's written, by the way, the manuscript is, you know, we talk about cutting and pasting <laughs> on, on the computer, very easy, moves footnotes and everything along with it. Well, in the, through this, not a great deal, but there are a number of cut and paste places. You know, he's, he's changed something and there's, a, you know, maybe a quarter of a page that has pasted over whatever he had written. I, part of me had the urge to like unglue those and see what, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, Actually, one of the things um, John Harley Warner from Yale suggested um, uh, leaving the, the words that are, you know, that are crossed out, leave them in. 
Mm -hmm. You know, that people like, historians like to see that. So, in fact, when I got it back, they had, they had gotten rid of them. They had to put them back in, uh, uh, you know, during production. Uh, sure. So there's a line through the word. So you can see what he, what he changed. None of them what, what he changed, changed his mind about. Yeah, well, it, mostly grammar and things like that. But his spelling's quite good. And his, um, I, t I, I kept his original spelling. And the only thing I sicked, you know, uh, you know, put square brackets and say, was if it didn't, if I couldn't find it in the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, one of the earlier spellings, and it wasn't in one of uh, um, uh, three or four um, medical dictionaries from 1790s and 1800s. If I couldn't find it, I'd say, but very few of them. So his spelling was quite good. It's very readable. Uh, I've gone over it so many times, and every so often, is that what he really said? I better go back and look at the, uh, look at the original manuscript. Um, which the Maine Historical Society was kind enough to copy for me. And uh, so I have it right over here, and I, I bet 20, I must have read 20, 30 times the, the yeah. whole manuscript through the years. Go on, you had some other questions. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, Mark asks, um, or excuse me, um, Craig asks, can you speak any more to what Dr. Barker thought were effective ways of curing consumption? Do you know what kind of treatments he prescribed? Um, he um, alkalized were one of the things. And then the standard treatments that other people were using. The, um, 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 what, what do we call it? I mean, laxatives, all the usual. I mean, we would say none of them were in looking at the 20, from the 21st century, none of them were efficacious. But uh, there were the standard treatments that were in the books at the time, because he was citing various. And he cites, if he says, uh, he cites the literature. So, and I have put all of those in there. So if anybody's interested in that, they can look in the, um, um, uh, look up consumption, uh, treatment, whatever, and they'll see all the, the references that he used. Because he and I found just about I think all of them I don't think I missed any um, uh, journals books and I found that that he stuck um, if if he quoted something from a book from 1782 uh, I, I I could find it and and generally not every time but I could find the quotation and that he he cited it correctly you know this is another this will probably be a tough question to answer but Neil is wondering. Do you know how many doctors, or maybe we should say like practicing, um, people practicing medicine in the mid, you know, at this time, like the 1770s in Maine? Um, I, don't, I, don't I, don't have that, I don't have that number in my head, um, uh, but um, he lists in, I can't think it's chapter one of his manuscript, chapter one or chapter two, a whole bunch of physicians in, uh, um, uh, you know, around Portland, Gorham, um, going up to, um, uh, going up the coast, uh, not all over Maine, because of course Bangor wasn't much, you know, in seven, when he started in 1770, there weren't many people in Bangor. It was, it was the, the uh, uh, Portland, Falmouth, um, uh, Gorham area, but going up the coast, maybe 30, he went up and down the coast, say 40 miles, and he mm -hmm. has a number of physicians. And I think I've found, almost all of them, if not all of them. So if, he, if uh, whoever the questioner wants to look, it's in the book and the physicians are named and where they were. And, and generally there's a footnote, you know, uh, that I could find what I found about them, um, the various physicians. But I, I can't give you a number. But he said when he, there's some towns, uh, um, there weren't any physicians, you know, that, um, and it, there weren't very many. He said Cape Elizabeth, people were so healthy that it wouldn't support, it wouldn't support a, um, a doctor being there full time. Right, right. And, and I love that he came with doctors I, for his health. He, he left the Cape uh, for, um, uh, uh, for the, the air and uh, doctors being numerous, you know, down, down in the Cape. So and this is, you know, part of this is during the revolution too. Mm -hmm. Do you know um, if you, you mentioned uh, life expectancy, um, 
you know, especially how if people can live through a lot of people, you know, child mortality it was very high um, in this time period. If you if you survived childhood, you actually had a pretty good chance of, of living to an old age. Um, can you speak to that a little bit more? Someone's asking, did people with with more means live longer, longer than people of, of limited means because they had better access to medical treatment? Was there, was, it, was there a difference between living in the city or living in a rural setting? Definitely, definitely rural city. Um, and it had to do, uh, and I, I think all of these, um, uh, I, I, my, my guess is as far as the physicians, I would say that probably didn't have a big, make a big difference. Mm -hmm. you know, from what we know now, except for very few, very few things. Uh, but um, if you, um, I, I didn't, I couldn't get, I didn't have enough time to get into this, but uh, but it has to do like with COVID-19, how many, how infectious is the organism and how many opportunities do you have to transmit it or have it transmitted mm -hmm. to you? So if you lived in a farm, a uh, rural farm and, and only, uh, this is uh, just something about churches, um, uh, only came to town once every two weeks, you know, you probably had less chance uh, than if you lived in the city and particularly in a tenement, you know, with the people crowded together, just like today. Uh, but I wondered, and I've never seen a study of this, whether in rural areas where, um, you know, Alan Taylor's book, you know, the, um, uh, about church religion and everything inland. Mm -hmm. so, so in rural areas, might uh, uh, the only time some pe some people on farms might see other people might be at church, going to church regularly. And mm -hmm. I wondered whether there was an increase um, disease transmission for the the people who who went to church regularly because that might be the one of the few times that they would see other people regularly and I, transmit it. But I've never seen anything one way or yeah. another. It's an issue for COVID-19 too. I, I know a lot of people, we've, we're getting a, a, the questions continue to come in. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're running short on time. So I'm, I'm gonna ask just one more question in a moment. Um, but I wanted to uh, thank you, uh, thank Dr. Khan again um, for uh, taking, his taking some time this evening um, to uh, share his expertise uh, with a nice dash of humor for us. Um, and remind folks that you can purchase uh, the book, you can purchase Dr. Khan's book uh, through the Maine Historical Society Museum store. And if you're curious about um, more of MHS programming, um, seeing some of our past programs, uh, if you're interested in visiting Maine Historical Society or making an appointment to do research at our library, uh, just like Dr. Khan has been uh, researching at our library for so many years, visit our website, uh, mainhistory.org, uh, to learn more about the organization, uh, what you can do here, um, and how you can become a member. So the last question I'm going to ask, um, I really liked this question from Mark. Um, Dr. Khan, have you ever thought about what sort of physician you would have been um, if you had lived in Barker's time? Hmm. I like, <clears throat> I'd like to think I was like him. I mean, I've always been curious and I try to instill that in medical students, students, kids, grandchildren. Um, I mean, medicine is so interesting. And I'll just, I'll give you one quick story. Um, um, uh, Faith Fitzgerald is, was professor of medicine at University of California, Davis, and, and then president, actually. She's a wonderful teacher, and, um, and she, was, um, she wrote a number of years ago about, um, uh, she, was, she said, all patients are interesting. Either they have interesting problems, they're interesting people, or both. They have interesting lives. And I've always gone by that. I, re I really think that's true. So anyway, she was talking to a number of residents and, and students, and uh, she, she said that, what I just said to you. And one of the residents said, oh, I just ad admitted a, a, an old um, uh, Irish uh, seamstress with heart failure, common problem. And what can be interesting about that? So Dr. Fitzgerald said, okay, well, let's go in and see her. And they talk with her and examining her. And, 
And Dr. Fitzgerald says, I see you have a scar on your arm. What is that from? He said, oh, um, um, I fractured my arm. And, she, and Dr. Fitzgerald said, well, how did it happen? She said, oh, a chest slid off and fell on it. Uh, what kind of chest was it? Well, it was a sea chest, you know, one of those big, you know, and Dr. Fitzgerald said, well, where were you? Uh, well, I was on the Titanic coming over here. So this woman was, so this resident, I just love to see his face. Yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> How many people have you met that survived the Titanic? And this lady uh, fractured her arm. Well, and I've always found that uh, dealing with patient, uh, patients, as Barker does, uh, they're interesting, they have interesting problems. Um, it's nice to be able to help them, um, or at least if you can't cure them to make them more comfortable. Uh, and we're, I think, I've always loved medicine and, uh, um, and education, books um, is an important part of my life. And uh, I hope, I th I'd say, I hope I would be a doctor like, um, like Barker. I mean, I, I think he, he tried and he tried to improve medicine. Now the mm -hmm. social historians would say, oh, he was trying to get more market share. You know, I mean, well, I mean, that's the way, and I can't say that that's wrong. My feeling when I talk to medical students and residents, I say there are physicians with a capital P, business people with a small b. You know, I mean, their main thing is their mm. physicians. Uh, and then there's some that are really uh, physicians with a small p and business people with a big b. Yeah. Most people are someplace in the, in the middle. But, sure. you know, what kind of physician do you want to be? You know, uh, um, anyway. It's, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much again uh, for that. Thank you for sharing um, your uh, this all this great information and, and your work with us. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. I hope that we'll see you all back here again uh, soon. We are offering another um, medical uh, history uh, program on January 27th. Um, we're doing a book program on merchants of medicine. Um, a new book from uh, Zachary uh, Dorner. So I, I hope uh, if this is a topic that interests you, mark your calendar uh, and join us again on January 27th. Uh, but thank you all again for being here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Khan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.